Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us for another session here of our vlog. Today we are very, very lucky and, uh, and blessed uh, to have Mary Hollow from Prickly Pear Land Trust join us. Mary, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. This is exciting. It's we my first vlog. Oh, well, great. <laughs> we're, we're glad to have you here. Um, uh, it, it can be sometimes slightly unnerving when you've never <laughs> done this before. And like me today, I was scrambling, trying to find my notes and, and things I had before we got started. So I was a little off, uh, off kilter as we got started, <laughs> but I found everything finally. So I'm right there with you. Great. So Mary, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Great. Uh, so I was, uh, Born and raised here in Helena. My mom grew up on the High Line on a farm in Chester. My dad is from Great Falls. Um, my parents are teachers, longtime teachers, and they both taught in the school system here in Helena. They were music teachers. Um, I was, so I was always a music kid and into kind of like theater and things like that. And am now, uh, um, well, Let's see. I uh, after high school, I guess maybe my junior year, my dad said, "Well, Mary, do you want to go to Bozeman or Missoula?" <laughs> and all my friends were <laughs> touring um, these really cool liberal arts colleges all over the Northwest, and I thought, "Well, I guess uh, Missoula." And that was about the extent of the thought that went into that. And lucky for me, Missoula was wonderful, and uh, so that's where I ended up going to college. I studied, I started out in music, of course, because I thought, well, I know that's something I can do and soon realized maybe I should try something else and see if there are other things I want to do um, in my studies and possibly in a job someday. So I uh, ended up graduating with degrees in economics and business finance. And at the time, Senator Baucus in Washington, D.C. was hiring for um people to work on the tax team of the finance committee in DC. And I had a really great mentor. I had a, an internship with the Montana um, business trade center at the business school there in Missoula. And this great mentor of mine said, you know, Mary, you really need to get the hell out of Montana <laughs> and go somewhere else for a little while. So uh, he was right. And it was wonderful. Um, I, he connected me with Senator Box's office, and I ended up going to D.C. and working for Max for a while in D.C. in um, tax policy. A lot of my cohorts obviously went to New York and bigger financial centers, Chicago, but I wasn't really interested in that. So spent some time in D.C. Um, after a few years, realized I missed the Rocky Mountains and missed the West. I missed my family and kind of made a, a decision to not climb the ladder in D.C. Um, and instead focus on the things that really filled my bucket and fed my heart. Um, Montana, the outdoors, my family were certainly those, those things. So my mom thought I was crazy. What are you doing coming back here? You don't have a boyfriend. You don't have a, you've just quit your high paying job. Um, and she, you know, certainly there was some some risks associated with that for me, but I'm, I, it turned out all right. <laughs> um, so yeah. And then I, I found my way back to, uh, managing fly fishing, a fly fishing lodge in the Blackfoot Valley, North Fort Crossing with, um, Paul Roos and Brandon Bodecker and, um, John Kowalski, that crew, and then did a little bit of, um, fly shop management on the, uh, the Missouri River, but really I just spent quite a bit of time fishing and hanging out on the rivers. <laughs> so yeah. Um, and that eventually led me to the Nature Conservancy. How do you end up in that shift? You're Because you, you and I have known each other for a while. Yeah. And so for our readers, right, you get into this fun world where for those folks who don't know the fly fishing world, it's a ton of fun, but you don't make money. You, you don't get paid right. squat for it. <laughs> but boy, is it fun. It's so, so you, fun. You're out on the river every day. Even in the evening, you can go float the river in the summer. But then you decide nature cons conservancy. How does that happen? It, it was, well, it's it was sort of happenstance. And I, as the lodge manager for the um, North Fork Crossing at the time, was hosting events that the Nature Conservancy was um, having at the lodge in the Blackfoot Valley because that was ground zero for their Montana Legacy project and Blackfoot acquisitions that 
they were making at that time. That was when Plum Creek Timber Company was um, five or 10 years into being a REIT, a real estate investment trust, where they had to sell off land. And in Western Montana, they were selling off large tracts of timber land that they had already harvested. And groups like the Nature Conservancy were seeing great conservation value for things like grizzly bears and um, winter range for ungulates and, um, and open space protection in the Blackfoot Valley and up throughout the, the Sealy Swan. So the leadership for the Nature Conservancy was spending quite a bit of time in the Blackfoot Valley, and, and my lodge was the one that was a really easy and great place to host events like that. There aren't that many um, commercial sort of outfits like that in the Blackfoot Valley, so it was sort of the go-to place. So I became friendly with the leadership, um, and when they had a job open on the Rocky Mountain front as a land protection specialist. And then they also needed a little bit of help uh, doing government affairs work, which was connected to my previous role with Max. Um, It just seemed like, okay, now is maybe a good time to make that shift. But I guess um, in a more fundamental sense, I've always operated on the assumption and, and with the intention that you need to take the forks in the road really seriously and explore them um, thoroughly before you decide one way or another. Those forks in the road being, do you do you try and stay in the really fun fly fishing industry forever and figure out a way to make it happen? And are you, are you uh, going to be able to um, do the things in your life that you want to do in that kind of role? Or is there some way that you can do something else but yet still enjoy those things about the fly fishing and the outdoors of Montana that you love um, just on the weekends. <laughs> and so that was kind of um, ultimately, you know, how that was the fork in the road that I explored, I guess, at that time. And um, But I, I think the other piece of that, too, is having really good mentors and finding the right people who have your best interests in mind and who see things in you that that even you may not know exist or that even you may not know the full extent of um, the potential that you have. So So how'd you go about finding your your first mentor? So I think in business school, I believe there was at one point, and I don't even remember which class it was, but there was, I had a professor who encouraged all of us to actually take class time to sit down and think about mentors and and how you choose mentors and what a good mentor looks like and um and that can be different for every person right like for me I wanted mentors who were going to really push me and challenge me to do things that I was maybe a little bit uncomfortable with or didn't know things about or um or someone who would push me to grow in ways that I um, you know, grow in new ways and explore and see new things. Um, so my first mentor was actually a pretty intentional exercise in a class. And, um, and the, the person that I ended up choosing was a banker in Missoula and is still a really good friend today. Excellent. Yeah. So, you come to this decision of joining the Nature Conservancy. What is it that drove you to that decision at that time? What were some of the factors that were really weighing on you to, to balance which way to go, one way or the other? I was also uh, in uh, my first real um, relationship with love and thinking, well, maybe I could settle down and you know, be married someday and maybe have a family someday. Um, That was certainly one thing. I think also just the seasonal nature of the fishing industry was starting to kind of wear on me. Just, you know, such um, busy seasons in the summertime, working every single day. And then in the winter, wondering what you're going to do with your life, you know, do I go? And um, I guess one winter I, I entered an MBA program and kind of thought, well, maybe I could do that. But um, I was excited for more of the like sustainable year-round work, I guess. 
Okay. Yeah. And then with Nature Conservancy, what specific to them really drew you at that time in your life? You know, they work at a really, really large scale, and the projects that they were doing at that time were of really, really huge importance for areas that I care deeply about. My family has had a cabin in uh, the Lincoln area of the upper Blackfoot um, forever, and I've forever spent a lot of time in the summers up there. So there was a little tie of like a sentimental, familial um, piece of it, but also just the the scale at which TNC was making really, really huge things happen in the state. I wanted to be a part of that. And I also recognize that as like they, they are a global organization and they don't always have such huge, excite, exciting work going on. And that was a moment when wow, this could be a really, really awesome and fun and exciting, you know, place to work um, while they work on these massive land deals over the next five to 10 years. And so that was, that was definitely a piece of it too, but also to be able to bring in my DC experience. And so I served as their government affairs director. Uh, I also did land protection projects because I really wanted to stay tied to ranchers and the landscape and the people in the communities that I knew. So I kind of was able, and they were willing to accommodate that I do a little bit of both. Obviously, over time, that government affairs role became more and more important to the chapter and to the region um, because it really meant more and more appropriations and more and more funding coming back into the state for conservation projects, which, you know, there were years when we would receive between 25 and $30 million in federal funding to make the work that we were doing happen. So... Um, so I definitely ended up over time spending more and more time in that government affairs realm to keep um, keep us fed. So. <laughs> so then at what point do you say, okay, I I'm here at Nature Conservancy and now now I'm looking for the next thing in life. What, what drove you to that? Was it an opportunity came by? Was it one of your mentors? And then how'd you end up going through that process? Um, that's a, yeah, that's a great question. I was definitely not looking to do something else. So I'd been at TNC for almost 10 years and was really happy there, loved my coworkers, loved the mission, loved the work. Um, it was really the at the encouragement of the person who had hired me to work at the Nature Conservancy, who had since then gone on um, to run the Wilderness Society at the national level. And then also um, Andy Bauer, my predecessor at Prickly Pear Land Trust, who um, you know led the land trust for what almost fifteen years, and he and and his wife Betsy had said, you know, you should really think about this. And at first, I brushed it off. No, 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 I can't do that. I I think I had a nursing baby at the time, and uh, really, you know, personal life and professional life was good and and very busy. So why mm -hmm. would I switch anything up at this point? You know. Um, but he, he said it again the next time I saw him and, and I did start to really think about it. So that's when I called Jonathan Krause, who was the board president at that time and just, you know, visited with him and got his take. Um, I visited and met, introduced myself for the first time to Jim, Jim Utter back during that, um, time period. And, you know, really the more I explored the opportunity and that fork in the road, the more I did start to find myself thinking, you know, this is one of those times when I do need to push myself and challenge myself. And having had done the same sort of role at, at TNC for about 10 years, I was very, very comfortable in it and could have done, as some would say, could have done some of it in my sleep, you know. Um, and I'm still pretty young in my career, and I wanted to find challenge and find places to growth, to grow and, and find, um, you know, new ways that I could be uh, more effective in whatever capacity or organization I was in. So this, and, and I think also, you know, Prickly Pear Land Trust was, I was, it was something in an organization I was really comfortable with and I knew really well, um, having grown up here, having seen it develop over time, um, and then frankly, um, benefiting from the work that the Land Trust had done uh, in the time when I was at college and away doing other things. I came back and it was very impressive and relevant 
to Tyler and I in our lives the second that we arrived back in Helena. Um, so it was also, there was also that too, of, you know, to work at a local level in our and my hometown um, and really see where the organization could go was, it was also a really exciting opportunity again. Mm-hmm. So, um, but again, it took kind of exploring that a little bit more and, and more deeply going down that fork in the road a little bit to sort of, um, to see that, um, and really fully consider it. So, yeah. So you'd never been an executive director. You get together with some of the folks on the board for PPLT. (laughs) You know, Andy's ready to move on to a different chapter in his life. And he'd been there for a long time. And it, it was amazing to watch the organization grow under Andy. So you're, you're stepping into big shoes. Yeah. Right. What are some of the biggest challenges you faced? How did you deal with them, overcome them? You know, that's a good question. Um, honestly, I think one of the biggest challenges was um, somewhat of a perception of like, oh, you're just a like young girl. <laughs> and so many people knew me as that like, um, you know, young girl who grew up in Helena. And of course, by then I'd gone on and done other things, but still, um, I think there's, there is also this very like modest sort of, um, old guard Helena way that is not quite as progressive in a professional setting. And so it was, that was, um, and, and I don't even, I wouldn't say that was like a huge challenge. It was just something that was very present in some of those first years of, can you really do this? Are you really old enough to do this? And, you know, meanwhile, I'm thinking like there are CEOs in the Silicon Valley who've been <laughs> running giant uh, companies and they're doing a really great job. And there's a reason why they do a really great job. And part of that is their youth. Um, so I was also really even though that was like a place where I found some pushback sometimes, I also saw that though as a point of something that I could bring to the table that was unlike what the organization would have had had it hired somebody who was, you know, say 55 and super duper set in their um, styles and career paths and like they, you know, knew exactly what they wanted to do. I didn't come in with a lot of like preconceived ideas or notions about what I thought PPLT should do, could do. And that was actually, as it turns out, I mean, I didn't know any of this, obviously, at the time, but that not having really hard feelings or thoughts about what the organization should do in the next few years, and just sort of being open to letting it grow organically and letting it address and respond to the community as that community grew and changed, as the um, as our community grew and changed, it was actually a really key piece, I think, to some of the early successes that we saw when um, when I first came on. And being open and receptive to that is is important, and being comfortable in some of the unknowns, right? Like it's it's a lot easier sometimes to sort of know exactly how things are going to play out when you go a certain direction and like, oh, yep, we got this, you know, but, um, but being a little bit vulnerable, being a little bit, um, you know, taking on a a little bit more risk and letting things sort of play out, letting the community, you know, inviting the community um, to provide lots of input and shape things. Ultimately, um, was a really, really great thing at that time. So, Absolutely. So in, in the business world, we all, you know, executive directors, CEOs, we all have limiting beliefs, things that we aren't certain that we can do. What were some of yours thinking back to when you first stepped into those shoes in PPLT that you said, oh my gosh, am I really ready for this? And then how'd you get over it? Yeah. My coming into it, my biggest fears were, and and those fears were driven by just really a lack of experience and hands-on experience in a couple of realms. One of those was 
um, building and managing a team. Um, I had done a little bit of that, but really most of my experience and what and how I ultimately um, define myself in that role at PPLT was fed largely by the, you know, everybody has had good bosses and bad bosses. I w took a very um, intentional look at who were my good bosses? Who were, who were they? What were their strengths? What, how did they lead? And are those stylistic ways, things that I can adopt in my own way at PPLT? Some of those, you know, people were people like Senator Baucus and Jim Messina, who ran Obama's 2008 campaign. I mean, when I looked back, I thought, you know, and actually this was a question that the board asked me in my final interview. How are you going to lead the team? You've never had major hands-on experience. And I said, well, no, I, I haven't, but I have worked for really, really great leaders. And that in some ways is more valuable than, um, you know, than not having had that interface with really, really amazing leaders. Um, I also contacted people like Jim Messina and Senator Balkis and uh, let's see, who were my other, Dave Carr and um, some of my longtime friends and bosses, B Hall at, from the Nature Conservancy. And, and um, I spent time with them, you know, visiting and thinking through um, what were the strengths and what were the, um, the things that they did well and that I wanted to emulate and then tried to be really intentional about doing that. What do you mean when you say be intentional in trying to do that? Because so many times I see business owners uh, or, or people taking on this leadership role and they say, well, I'm intentional about it. And then you ask them, well, what do you mean you're intentional? And they go, oh, I don't know. I think it, you know, probably means something different. Maybe every time somebody says it. For me, when I say that I want to be intentional about something, if I want to be intentional about paying closer attention, say to um, quality of like life in the workplace, say, for example, like that is me, A, telling myself that, I want to keep that at the forefront of my mind. And as I'm talking with people in the community and working with folks um, on projects or, um, you know, working on getting ready for Harvest Moon, if I see an opportunity in amongst my day-to-day -day business that can be something that is going to, um, like a change I could make at Prickly Pear that would improve the quality of life for my employees... I want to be present to capture that thought or that idea, write it down, talk to the staff about it, make it happen, maybe not, depending on what the feedback is. But um, when I say I want to be intentional about things, it's, those are the things I want to have at the forefront of my mind. So it's as much me telling myself that. Um, but I also am very transparent in how I operate and I like to be, I want my team to know what I'm being intentional about. And I try to articulate that same kind of thing for the board. It's really um, uh, like a self check too. And I really like that part, that, that last part it being a self-check for you by articulating it to others, we are accountable yeah. when we put it out there, right? If the easiest way to fail at something is to not tell anybody because then there's no accountability, right? Right? Oh, I, I'm, I'm going to achieve X or I'm, I'm going to lose weight, but right. you don't tell anybody and then you don't have anybody who's actually going to hold you to it. But if you tell people, here's how I want to act right. within our organization, now you've got an accountability partner, right? Right. That's what's great about that. And right. and 
that's where I was kind of hinting at, uh, yeah. which I loved where you went with your story because too many times I'll be with a business owner who says, oh, well, no, no, I'm, I'm very, I'm passionate about X, Y, and Z, and, and by golly, this is how I do it. And I say, okay, great. Who else knows that? Yeah. Well, it, it, it's me. Well, yeah, but who else have you told that so that they can be your accountability partner? Right. Right. Because it's easy for us to see our world through our rose colored glasses and believe that we're doing those things. Right. And it's not until somebody else can call us out on the mat when mm -hmm. we're not that we'll catch it. Well, it also means if you tell somebody you are, you know, trying to be intentional about something, you also need to be willing to recognize that you might, you need to be comfortable with the fact that you might fail. Yeah. And you might, and how are you, how are you going to respond, um, if and when that happens is is so telling of your um, your own resiliency and comfort, but also, um, you know, how you handle that piece of it, it, it should that be the direction it goes, is also really, um, I think, as leaders, important to be out in the open about. Like, everybody fails at things. Mm -hmm. Some, you know, s sometimes, and you hope, <laughs> it's less than more, but... The reality is that not everything works the way you think it's going to, you say it's going to, and and it's and that's okay. Mm -hmm. It's life. It's how you handle it and deal with that both personally as an individual or as a boss or as a team or as an organization in a community that really matters. It's less about the actual fact that you failed and more about, you know, are you um are you, are you being honest and open with yourself about that and how you could have, you know, in, in how you handle it, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. How do you learn from it? Because yeah. uh, my big thing is, is uh, with my team, uh, it's always, it's, it's not about that we didn't get it right, but did we learn from it? Right. Right. Because to me, true failure is only if you aren't learning from your mistakes. Right. And, and because you're going to fail if you are repeating the same thing over and over again. Right. So that that's why I I just love your story there. Um, absolutely fantastic. So e here you are. You're you're you've got some of these limiting beliefs. You're 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 killing them. You're you're knocking them out of the way. You continue to grow. PPLT has seen unbelievable growth. Um, you've had a lot of I, I don't want to call it turnover, but as the organization changes, mm -hmm. right, and people get older and they move different places, like any organization, how did you deal with that? Because now all of a sudden you're thrown into the hiring world. Yeah. Right. Right. So that I honestly have to say, I got really lucky with some part of it. Um, I really. Uh, that was also something I had not done a lot of in the professional realm was hire people. And you're right, you know, you get new leadership. And the fact is, sometimes you have turnover. And more often than not, you do you have turnover when that happens. And it's not that's not a bad thing. It just, it's just part of it. Um, and building and then you kind of have the opportunity, right, then to build your team in the way that complements you and the rest of the team members best for the organization. So we early on we did this and I'm <laughs> I'm not like, um, I don't have a ton of experience in like, you know, leadership or team development or anything like that. But um, when I first came onto Prickly Pear Land Trust, through the Land Trust Alliance, I did a leadership development program. And through that, we had this tool that was kind of a mix of Myers-Briggs and a organizational development tool for the team. And we did a, a pretty formal strengths-based assessment for each individual member of the team and then the team itself. And really what that did was help tell us where our strengths were and where within the team when we hired, as we saw that turnover take place, we could kind of focus on filling it. <clears throat> so if you think about like a, you know, whole spectrum, you really want as much diversity and um, coverage, if you will, in your team as possible. What we found in that initial assessment was that we had pretty good coverage. We had um, a kind of a good uh, map of what personality traits and strengths and 
um, kind of a good mix for the land trust at the time. Again, as we started to see some turnover, I just tried to focus a little bit of the sort of interpersonal um, characteristics of those positions I was trying to fill, um, trying to make matches with who we ended up hiring. Um, again, though, you get lucky. Mm -hmm. And I do feel like I do feel like we got lucky. I think that the conservation industry and working in land land protection and open space and trails in Montana is a coveted place where people who nationally want to do this work tend to look to see if there are opportunities. And so when we do post a position, we get again, we're lucky. We get really um, great candidates smart, smart people from all over the country who are interested in doing this work for, for all the right reasons. And so I do in that sense, feel like, you know, we were, we're really blessed with that piece of it, but, but there always is that unknown, um, side of, of when you hire somebody, you just don't know everything. Um, I also think Joel, that there's a generational workforce um you know we have we have a lot of different generations in the workforce right now and everybody mm -hmm. sort of operates differently and needs different things thrives in different settings and the up and coming generations are more apt to stay for shorter periods of time in their positions and that makes me wonder and i've thought actually about things lately in that realm, how do we build positions in organizations that are transferable more, that are more easily transferred and um, transitioned when those transitions occur so it doesn't cause as much disruption for the organization? And, you, and so that you don't depend on, you know, somebody staying for 10 years because the reality is that there aren't that many, um, 20 somethings who intend to stay somewhere for 20 years, like our parents did, you know, or like some of us do, you know? So that I think is just something that's a like workforce consideration when you hire and build teams that, that you need to be thinking about too. I don't know. There's so I'm, many factors. Yeah. I want to jump in right here. Cause okay. you, now you, you got me going now. I'm okay. This is cool stuff mm -hmm. right here. Cause this is literally every owner of a business, yeah. their struggle today. Right. Right. And, and and I don't care what age you're at. When you're running a business, your mind says, well, I'm hiring this person in. They're going to be with me for a while. Yeah. But we know that's not the case anymore. Right. But our mind still says, oh, well, wait, Bob, Joe, Sally, they're, they're, they're here for the long term, right? This is in our head. We're all happy. We got them hired. Now I can push that off to the side but we can't. So the, I, I got two questions for you, which is one, how are you going about the hiring process? Because I struggle with it. Um, so many other employers struggle with it. And then the backup question is, how do you prepare your organization for, I don't want to call them short timers, short term employees, but knowing that the odds are your employees are not going to last beyond three years. Because of where the in, yeah, just just where where our... the generations and their tendencies lie. Yes. Yeah. Um, so start with the hiring process, right? How do you deal with this in the hiring process? So I, instead of being so strapped or um, committed to a actual like major process. I've backed off a little bit from that in that if I, if there's somebody out in the community who would be a good fit for a position, um, you know, I try and spend a little bit of time with them first to see if that might be the case. And frankly, that saves a lot of time. Sometimes, um, sometimes that's the, you know, well, I guess to say, if you fly a position, you might not catch the person who would be a really good fit. So to not be wed entirely to just, you know, um, just the one hiring process. If you know somebody is out there and you think you might be able to 
convince them, right, to come work for you. That sometimes is a more cost-effective um, time efficiency and, you know, quicker arrival to what you need than trying to, you know, post a position and, you know, get a bunch of applicants and go through everything. I mean, that's a really, really exhaustive process if you do it well. Um, I don't, I don't think any nonprofit, because we're, we just operate with such a small team on everything. I wouldn't say anybody does it like super well, um, nor do we do it the same every time. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's, it's, it's hard. It's definitely, Mm -hmm. definitely a challenge, but, um, but yeah, so depending on what the position is or what the need is, I sort of say, well, is there somebody out there that we know? Yes, no, okay, then mm-hmm. that next step, do we need to run a process? And if so, who's going to be on the hiring committee? Um, what is that process going to look like? We, again, though, we've been lucky. We have been really, really lucky. We have Prickly Prairie Land Trust has the most amazing, um, I mean, I am, I am grateful every single day for the staff that I get to lead and the amazing human beings that they are. Um, I was in a meeting yesterday with your lovely wife (laughs) and I got, and I don't, I try not to miss an opportunity to tout the fact that she's been with the land trust 11 years and the amount of stability and um, fitness that gives the organization is it's, it's unsurmountable. I mean, it's, it's, um, it is such a huge source of our competency in the work and the projects that we do, especially those in the arena that where she leads. But as an example, that's, um, you know, that's certainly one, but she's, that's, you know, I wish everybody, (laughs) right, would stay for 11 years, but the reality is that that's not the case. So. So hiring is one thing, right? Mm -hmm. So I know in our office, we are very intentional about how we go about it. First thing we do is we tell everybody in the team, okay, great we're looking to hire this person, this type of person. We we know the qualifications we're looking for. If we can find that person with the qualifications, if not, here's the type of characteristics we're looking for regardless. Mm-hmm. Um, if you know anybody, yeah. let's, let's get them in. Let's talk to them. And then our second step is then posting a job out there if we can't find that person locally or somebody that we know that would be interesting moving to, uh, you know, Helena or Bozeman. And then, you know, we go through that process. Our biggest difficulty is uh, we don't get tons of applicants. Yeah. The, the legal world is unbelievably difficult so because we get so few applicants. So it's a big challenge for us. Uh, and, and so we have to be so, you know, focused about how we go about the process. Mm-hmm. Um, but then once you get them in, Right, knowing that the odds are they're not going to be there for more than a few years, how do you prepare the organization for that? What is, and I know it varies depending on the role, but yeah. you know, you you think about this overall, and I'd never really thought about it that way. That is the part that I've spent more time thinking about lately. How do you build positions in a way that they are e- more easily transitioned? and transferred when there is turnover. Um, there, I'm, I've been at PPLT, you know, five years now, and I'm in a place where I can, I, I have a, a good handle a little bit, I, or mostly, I think, on that. Um, and I spend time with my team talking about that, too, um, to some degree. But that is, that's kind of my next... You know, how do you write a position description for the essential pieces that it must meet? And in the nonprofit world, of course, we ask people to do a number of different things and wear different hats because we have to. Prickly Pear is one of the larger nonprofits in town and very, you know, stable in every single way. But even we have staff who wear very different hats. And I, I honestly too, from, and this is more of a nonprofit, um, thing. I try and hire people who are, um, 
interested in trying a variety of things and helping out in a variety of ways who aren't going to be so defined to one specific role or job function and who are going to, if the need arises, to, yeah, I wouldn't mind doing a little bit of writing or a little bit of, you know, grant research or things like that. Um, the reality is that we all have to pitch in, in in whatever ways that we can. And if we come to the table, i.e. to the organization, with certain strengths that can be utilized in other ways outside of the job function for which we're hired, um, th- that's part of it too. You're, you're coming on to a team as much as you're coming into a position within Prickly Prairie Land Trust when you come to work for this organization. And I try and make that really clear in, um, in our hiring process too. I see that, you know, as someone who enjoys variety in my days, um, but also in folks, you know, coming out of say they're, you know, 25 and exploring different avenues within their professional realm, that's an opportunity to see what you really love and what really fills your bucket and what you're good at and what you would like to maybe develop a little bit more. Um, but that kind of attitude, and again, right, the attitude is everything, coming at it with a positive attitude and a willingness to try anything um, is something I value hugely at PPLT in my hiring. So we just went through uh, a series of interviews in our office for a new position, and I found it very interesting that in in these series of interviews we went through recently, that so much, so many of the questions we were getting were were right along the lines you were talking about, which was, "Tell us about your team, right." Tell us, tell us about the, the, the people that I'm going to work with more than they were interested in just the job itself, but they wanted to know that the people they were going to work with were people who were team players, not, I, I hate to say it, but backstabbers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, that's, that's again, I, as you know, Joel, that's like a, I think that's a key um, characteristic of the, um, up and coming generations in the workforce. And I think it's a really smart thing for that generation to be thinking about because the reality is, is that every place is a team environment and Mm -hmm. the happier and healthier that team is, the happier and healthier its individual members are, um, both at work and at home. Um, I've started to think too, I take, I take really seriously anything or try and find ways, I guess, um, of kind of keeping tabs on what's going on in people's personal lives and their professional lives because they Mm -hmm. are interrelated. Um, And to think that I, you know, don't need to worry about somebody's personal life is ridiculous. They, their, um, their ability to be happy and, um, as effect, as efficient and effective for PPLT as possible relies largely on their, you know, personal happiness. So if there are things that I can do as a, an employer for that team, i.e. offer gym memberships or, um, incur it, you know, do like group runs or like yoga classes, um, buy, you know, beers at the brewery for, <laughs> for those who love that, um, you know, try and find the things that people, that bring people joy, that help, and, and, but also that help people be healthier Mm -hmm. in the most, um, you know, the healthier you are, the more fit you are, the happier you're going to be, the more time you spend outside. I mean, right, this is right up PPLT's alley, of course, but, um, I encourage my staff to take lunch breaks and go take a hike on a trail that you haven't been on in a while, or, um, we actually, as a part of our work day, that's, that's a, that's an kind of an expectation is that you, you spend time outside, um, get a little fresh air, get a little sun on your face. Um, you know, get your heart rate up a little bit. You're going to come, ha- come back with some better ideas and a fresh start in for whatever it is you're working on. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I think it's 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 that more of that holistic perspective from the employer's perspective too that 
anything we can do to make that environment and cultivate that team playing um, is well worth our time and expenditure mm-hmm. too, you know. Well, and I think that kind of leads into also uh, the longstanding history PPLT has had in giving back to its community beyond just what it normally does. But uh, I know you guys, every year you go out with Helen Food Chair. You do uh, a one day where you get everybody out of the office. And that's something we've incorporated in our office. I thought when Andy was doing it and Andrea told me about it, at first I was kind of thinking, well, that's odd. A a nonprofit charitable organization going and helping another one. And then I thought, well, why not? Yeah. Right. Why not get your organization out into the community to help in a different way and to use it as a team building event? And so we've done that ourselves. And I thought that was just something great that you guys do. And and it gets everybody outside the office, gets some sun on their face, like you said, gets them thinking differently, thinking about giving back personally. Yeah. Um, We could do trail work days with the staff all day long, Mm -hmm. but to do something totally diverse and very different from what we see in our day-to-days at PPLT, i.e. going to food share and putting together Thanksgiving Day packets. Um, that is, it's it's just, I can't even say how awesome it is. And that's awesome that you guys are doing that. I mean, I really, um, that kind of team building is so good and, and fun. Um, but yeah, it's a way that we can all give back too. We can all do more. We can all give back more. And we have really great nonprofits in this town. And even the, you know, yes, PPLT is certainly one of them, but we can give back too. And, and my staff, they care about that. And so do I. Um, so that was kind of a no brainer. Mm -hmm. Ah, that's fantastic. Love it. So now we're coming into fall here pretty quickly you guys have one of your biggest events coming up tell us a little bit about it yeah so harvest moon is september 28th and that is our top um you know fundraising event of the year prickly pear receives almost all of its support from um private and corporate individuals like yourself joel thank you for sponsoring (laughs) harvest moon for so many years in a row um Truly, this organization is, this is one of the pieces to the work that I love the most. It's, it is with absolute, um, there's so much generosity in this community and there is, and there's so much genuine support for the work that Prickly Pear Land Trust does that it is one of the things that feeds me and keeps me going in this job that sometimes is a little bit trying, you know? definitely busier than I want to be some days. And, um, but there is so much positive feedback and positive, great support that it makes it worth it. And this event is one of those times when everything sort of culminates, we get 550 people, it sells out weeks in advance. Um, tickets are online, (laughs) I should probably mention that. And it, uh, you know, our corporate sponsors make that event happen. Um, free and clear of cost to the organization. So our sponsors pay for everything that puts that event together and makes it go off in a way that PPLT can receive the full donation from anything someone spends at the event that night. There aren't that many um, events like that in town. And so to be able to say that when you walk in the door, anything you spend goes directly to support the work of Prickly Pear Land Trust it's, um, that's a huge, huge, um, you know, draw, I think for the supporters that we have, but also, um, for me, I love, I love that event because of it. It's also just a huge celebration. And I think that, um, the world gets a little bit tough at times right now, and it's really important to celebrate the things that are good, the things that benefit everyone in a community, no matter what your skin color is or whether you spend time outside or (laughs) indoors more or what your preferences are, whether you like dogs or cats, you, um, we all need to celebrate the things that are good in our communities and for 550 of us to come together and do that for Prickly Pear Land Trust every year 
is I would say an increasingly important thing for, um, for people, for communities right now, um, and definitely for the organization, for our ability to grow and be better in the future. Absolutely. I'd like to kind of circle back around yeah. to a topic we had earlier, which is on mentors. Yeah. Because we talked about your use of mentors early on in your career as you yeah. were looking at transitioning from Nature Conservancy into PPLT. For too many of us, we stop at that level with our mentors and we don't keep in touch with them. We don't keep them front of mind. Yeah. I know that's not you. Yeah. Because I see you all the time with a couple of your mentors that I know about, and you're always talking with them. How is it you do that? Is that something that you're just clearly, um, you know, uh, uh, you keep that front of mind so that you're always there with them? What's some advice you can give to yeah. other young folks who are looking at jumping into kind of a role like yours? That's a really, um, that's a great question. And that's a really important point because it, as you get busier in your careers and in your personal lives, it becomes harder to maintain the connections that have been so important to you throughout, throughout your life. Um, I, one, one piece is that I don't ever stop looking for mentors as your roles change and you become like say in my personal life, I have, I have mom mentors. I have friends of mine who are way better moms than I am. And I strive like hell to be <laughs> like them and to do the things that they, you know, to emulate the things that they do and read the same books to my kids as they do to theirs and help promote as much kindness in my kids as I can. Um, so I, I guess that's, that's just one example, but I have, I guess a number of different types of mentors too. Um, in my life at this point. Um, initially it was with the charge of like helping me sort of push, where am I going to end up in my career and where am I going to be as a professional? Um, the, uh, people like, well, my board members, Jim Otterback, um, some of our bigger supporters in town. Um, some of, I mean, some of my staff, um, I, I think it's also important to have a diversity of age in your mentors. And one of the things that um, I picked up on in, I don't even remember where I thought of this or heard of this, but I took it to heart. Somebody once said, if you're, um, if you're 40, you should have a 30 year old mentor. Um, and I absolutely believe that because we communicate differently. We think differently. We are of different generations. We are driven by different things. Um, so they don't always have to be older. Um, but certainly, you know, I've, I've some of my, um, you know, definitely Jim Utter back on Prickly Pear Land Trust's board has become such a close friend and confidant. Um, and anybody in, an, in a director position, it's healthy and good for the organization, but them also as individuals, you have to have that partner on the board who, and if, and it's convenient if that person is your board chair, um, who has the same interests in their hearts and mind as well as you do. And, um, we also have a lot of fun together and it's a good thing. I like to fish because he does too, as you know. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, we've, we've become, so I guess the other thing about the mentor thing is that the lines start to blur the older you get with mm -hmm. your mentors, they become your friends and they mm -hmm. become the people that you spend more time with because really of the time that you do have, that's, that's your free time, there's less and less of it. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I, I really like the diversity in age. It's one I've never really thought of that way. But I, I feel like I'm so fortunate because I get to work with so many people in so many different areas of, of business and law. Uh, and it, it's just amazing to me to watch people work through different areas when I, I meet a young entrepreneur and they're telling me, you know, these amazing stories like uh, later today, I'm going to get to interview a really young entrepreneur, huh. uh, which is going to be a lot of fun. But that age variation brings to the table different quality skills. And, and so it's always fun to sit down with them and learn from them. Yeah. Well, shoot, just technology, right? Yes. Right. And, like, or, or apps, things that are yeah. coming out that you don't even have a clue about, but yeah. somebody in a different group does. Yeah. So, yeah. 
Well, Mary, I can't thank you enough for joining us oh, today. We've got to wrap awesome. up here. Yes, thank you so much. And a big shout out to Prickly Pear Land Trust and all that's going on in the Big Harvest Moon event. Another successful year for PPLT. Thank uh, you, Joel. We're going to have so much fun at that event, folks. Uh, make sure you get online, get your tickets, get them fast. Hopefully we get this out before the event so we can that would do, be a, great. do a yeah. little more promo for you. Yeah. Um, but... Again, uh, Mary, thank you so much. It's been unbelievable having you here. Remember, folks, we offer these interviews across all our podcast avenues. Uh, you can kind of, you can, not kind of, you can find us anywhere you listen to your favorite podcasts. Uh, you can find us on Facebook. You can find us on Instagram. You can find us on LinkedIn. And I, I know I'm forgetting tons of places. Ah, yes, there's one, YouTube. Yeah. Uh, our YouTube channel is a big one, so please subscribe to us there. We have more amazing guests coming uh, at you. Every couple weeks we're releasing a new one. Uh, this one's going to be exciting to drop to everybody because, uh, Mary, you're such a great friend. Uh, love yeah. all the, the stuff that you do. Love watching Prickly Pear grow and, yeah. and how the nonprofits in Helena continue to grow and evolve. It's just a blast to watch and, and how much uh, nonprofits play such a big part in our lives as communities. Yeah. So um, again, Joel Silverman is your host. I've got my main man over here on the camera, <laughs> Brad Oldhouse. Thank you, Brad Social Flicks. Uh, he's got it a little warm in the booth here for me today. I'm sweating like a monkey in here, <laughs> but we're having fun doing it. So thanks everybody for joining Thank us. Thank you so much for having me. This was great. <laughs> thanks, Mary. <laughs> thanks. And look forward to seeing everybody next time. Great. Great.